my name is Jim Beebe, and I'm a member of the Hub City Turning Club in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Today I'm going to make a presentation on basket illusion. Basket illusion is the process of turning on wood to make it look similar to woven baskets. And this is an example that is very similar to what we're going to do in this presentation. I think we're going to have a little bit of fun here. The purpose of basket illusion is to replicate designs that imitate African, American Indian, or other cultural or contemporary designs you may see in a gallery, a book, at various websites, or designs of your own. If you are a member of AAW, you can access the article written by Harvey Meyer in the October 16, 2016 issue of American Woodturner, or look it up at www.harveymeyer.com. It includes great detail and a number of photos. In this video, we will use a simple design on maple, about 8 inches in diameter. Here's a photo of the design we will be using in this video. It is best to create your own design or to follow a design you have seen elsewhere before beginning the turning. You should define and print a few copies of polar graph paper using Graph Paper Maker from BlackCatSystems.com with software available for both PC and Mac or Incompetech.com, which allows you to create your polar graph online and download it as a PDF. Our design must fit mathematically on the graph paper. For example, if our design repeats every six spokes and repeats eight times within the circle, you would need to print out a polar graph paper that has six spokes repeated eight times, which equals 48 spokes. The pattern determines the number of circles of beads required, which also determines the diameter of your project. Sometimes the beads repeat to within a half inch of center, and sometimes a larger unbeaded space is utilized near the center. We are at the point now where we can uh, start doing the turning on our block, block uh, for our project. It's very simple, uh, eight inches in diameter, approximately one inch thick, and because I didn't have an eight inch diameter uh, piece of wood, I laminated. That will make no difference because it's, everything's going to be turned on the base and, and right up to the top. So this is the bottom of your uh, project and this will be the top. On this side, getting ready to mount the faceplate on, on the back, I turned a, turned a circle on, on here so you could see what was there. It was centered. I cut a piece of three quarter inch plywood and I cut a piece of paper three inches in diameter. Put, uh, wood, put glue on this surface, put glue on the bottom surface of the three quarter inch plywood and glued them, made sure I was perfectly centered and clamped them. Now the reason for putting paper on in between the joint is that it's much, much easier to get the uh, sacrificial plate off when you're when you're finished your turning so after after that's done and that and the glue is dry you mount the uh, face plate mount it to the lathe and we're ready to turn first thing we need to do I've set this at just under one and a half inches and I have my center point 
So I will come in here and I will put the arc on. And there we are. This will be the size now of our tenon that we put on the back of, of the project. So once the circle is scribed on the back, you use the parting tool and we go in about a quarter of an inch. And because I happen to have dovetail jaws, I'm going to make a, a dovetail tenon. I have my gauge and we'll set for a quarter of an inch. Well, it's about a sixteenth short. I think that's close enough. I need a little bit more room here to make the dovetail, so I'm going to open it up here. And then I have a small skew chisel. The small skew chisel allows me to make the dovetail. And we're now ready to mount it with a, with a chuck. So we're, we're at this stage and we're now ready to start turning the bottom. The first part is we want approximately a quarter of an inch left at the top. Five sixteenths would be better. So about there, we put this in and that's where we're going to turn to. We're going to put the cone and bring it up as a safety feature. It will help to hold everything good and solid while we're turning. And we'll now continue with, with uh, cutting the shape of the bottom. Okay, we are now basically finished with the shape on the bottom. Now we start with leaving about a quarter of an inch on this, on this edge, on the outside edge. Okay. And then, this, this is a 1 8 inch beading tool from D-Way Tools. They are about $55, $60 uh, US, and by the time you ship them, you'll pay over $100 for it. Now, to use a beading tool, you need it to 
cutting at the center, center of the, of the project. So we're going to have to raise the, raise this, tool rest, and we're going to work at about a 45 degree angle for holding the tool. You want to be as close as you can get to your work. So this is, this is probably going to be pretty good. Going to work along here. The first stage of, of turning the beads is to score them. And all that means is you, you touch the tool in and just so you can see it. Okay, there's the first one. And from here on, it's the same process. Just keep moving. The left tip of the tool goes in the right groove from the previous bead. And just keep moving along. Now that all the grooves have been put in, it's time to start turning the beads. Mark the center of each bead so that when you are cutting the bead, when the pencil mark disappears in, when you're cutting, that's the point where you stop cutting. If you go too deep, well, you're going to have uneven tops on, on your beads. If you don't go deep enough, the top will remain flat. Your indicator is that stop turning the moment that that pencil line disappears. So we're going to start now. I'm going to slow the speed down a little. Starting at the, at the outside, slowly move into the grooves and start turning left to right. Not there yet.
pencil mark has disappeared. We're just at a, about exactly the place we want to be. It may be a little bit warped. We've got a little flat spot over here, so we're going to have to take a little more. You can just see a little bit of pencil mark there. Okay, you can check it just by turning it around visually. No flat spots and no pencil marks. And we just move right on to the next one. Stop and check them. No pencil marks. We're good to go. And we carry on right into the right into the end. We're done. We are now ready to start burning the valleys uh, between the beads. We try to get a dark color uh, at the bottom of the valleys and we use friction by using what I have is arborite and we turn, turn it, and we have to turn it fast. The closer you get to the center, the faster you have to go because it doesn't travel as far. Okay, I'm going to put this in and just burn the very first one. I'm going to turn, turn on, and then I'm going to go up to about 2,000 RPM. See if that will work. The arborite just fits in, and you press hard. About three or four burns is about all you're going to get before you sharpen it again. And you only have to sharpen a little bit of it. You can do that uh, half a dozen times, probably going across there. So I'm going to uh, sand this down again. It looks like uh, we've done pretty good. The color uh, of each of the valleys is roughly the same. So we're going to try and stay on that speed, maybe lower it a little bit when we move further out. Okay, I'm off to sharpen again. Because it's turning so much faster, 
you can you can do it faster. We're we're done. Like I did about six with this with this sharpening, and it worked out pretty pretty good. We are at the point where the back is finished, and we're ready to move to working on the front. We will, we will remove the assembly and take the uh, faceplate off and put it into a chuck. Set this over here. Okay, I am now going to fasten the uh, chuck, four jaw chuck on. Bring our project over. Okay, we're at the point where we fasten our project with the back of it onto the chuck. We st stick it in and fasten it tight the other side. One more time. Okay. Now we have to get rid of the uh, sacrificial uh, piece here to which the uh, faceplate was attached. And I, I always use just, just a chisel, good sharp chisel, and put it on, get the grinding angle, against the project. Just like that. It splits right through the paper. And now we'll just turn that flat and we'll begin the similar process to what we did on the back. The first thing we'll do is flatten the back of the front piece and then we'll use uh, calipers to do some turning and get it the same thickness towards the center. We'll flatten that out. I'm just going to take that little bit of glue off of it and turn the speed down. I think that's close enough. What we need to do now is go back to our, uh, our drawing of our project. And we have to decide how many uh, beads we're going to go. So well, that tells us then how much space is going to be left here unturned. If we go in three inches, for example, 
three inches would put us at uh, 24 beads. I'm going to say maybe we should go in three and a quarter. So I'm going to park, mark that. And that's a part that will not be beaded. So I'm back to uh, turning. We have to try to match the shape of the bottom by using the calipers. There we are. That's about the, what we want there. We should be going in no further than two inches with our thickness until we get our thickness. And then we come back and we do the beading up to that point. And then we go in with another two inches or however much space there is and finish it off. But uh, he, he says, don't go all the way through because you get too light up here, too thin, and you get too much vibration. So we try to keep as, as much stock on there all the time. I'm going to pull up the tail stock And for at least the first section, we can use this to steady it up and make it nice and solid. I'm going to use a uh, parting tool. And I'm going to get in close here. Okay, we'll stop and check. Pretty decent. Just finish it off. Check again. Pretty nice. Now that the top is uh, parallel to the bottom, we're ready to do the first set of beads. We follow the very same process as we did on the back. We will score them and then we, then we will come back and we'll actually cut the beads to size. Again, we want about a quarter of an inch on the inside. And I will just touch that. And that's where we're going to start. We're back with the beading tool and starting uh, at the outside, just scoring the beads first. And the reason for this is that we've taken away a lot of mass from this area and you start to get vibrations from it. And that's why we only do a short piece because if we take off the rest of the material toward the inside, then the whole thing will become unstable. And when you put the tool in, you're, you are definitely going to get some vibration. I think this is going to work for us.
Okay, our first first one is is fine. Now I'm going to score the rest of them. Okay, that's close enough. Now we can go back and we can begin doing the actual beading. We have to put the pencil line uh, halfway be between each side of the um, scoring. Now we're ready to start the beating. Okay, we've done the first section. Now we have to finish uh, turning this part so that uh, it's the right thickness. And we will do that right away and get the shape and the thickness together. And then we're ready to finish, finish it all off. And remember the pencil line here, we do not want to go past that. Lots of room there. We're ready to start the beading process again. We'll go with the scoring and then we'll do the beading right up to this piece here. I'm just going to finish off with the parting tool. Okay, off we go.
I'm one shy of, one bead shy of where I want to be. Okay, we are done with all the scoring right now. The next step again is to put the pencil mark halfway between each score line. Okay, and the beating starts. Okay, we're ready to finish off the face of our project. I'm going to take the nubbin off right now. Okay, the reason, the reason that I left it like this is that our pattern that we're following can be stopped anywhere from here to here, to the center, really. And when I was uh, doing it on the paper, I stayed out about six beads from the center. And so I did that. When you do it, if you do it, then you can, you can go all the way in if you want or stay out further. But you have to make that decision ahead of time. You can't say, oh, I wanted, I wanted that to be flat out to here. So be very careful and take a good look at your polar graph paper that you colored so that you know exactly what goes where and how far in you go from the outside and all of those all of those things that will make a big difference for you i i spent uh, a little while after we finished filming for the day and i burned burned these because uh, you don't need to watch me doing that again so after that was done, you can do whatever you like with the edge. And just for this purpose, I kept it simple and I just rounded it and sanded it. So this edge is done and the little piece that's left in the center, I also sanded that so that you can put a, a little bit of uh, color on it or you can leave it blank. Whatever, whatever you decide to do. It, it's uh, pretty simple from here on in. Now that this is all done, we're ready to start marking the spokes. And I'm going to show you all of the uh, jigs that we're going to have to use for it. Number one 
is your paper graph at uh, 48 uh, spokes, 48 spokes and 30 beads is what's on there. That comes to 1,440. Take, take this off. And I like to use 0 and 90 when I put this on here. And put the 0 so it's approximately vertical. And the 90 is approximately horizontal. This is what holds it tight on there. There we are. Now we can't move it. Because, because the bed of the lathe has a gap in it, it's best to put down a 12 by 16 piece of 3 quarter inch plywood so that everything is nice and smooth and, vertic and uh, a right angle to everything else. And you clamp it down to the bed. Okay, there we are. Now we're going to put the first jig on. This is the indexing jig, and it works this way. You set it down so it sits nice on here. Everything is nice and square, all directions. You put this down, it has to line up with one of, one of these spokes, and all you do is unlock your lathe and put it on so that it's right exactly on the line of one of them. It doesn't matter which one, but I like to start with 0 or 90. This is the little clamp you use. It's square on this side and tapered on this side. And you see a little gap is left in there when we press that in. And as long as it's held tight down to the down to the base, everything's fine. This is our pencil jig, Sim similar to this. The tip of the pencil must be at exact center of of the lathe. So we come in, put the pencil in the first groove. and just pull it back lightly and there's the first one. Now it's just a very repetitive process by taking the clamp off, moving the solar graph paper and lining it up with the top of the index jig clamping it, and we go back. And just keep on doing that. And in our case, we have 48 spokes and 30 beads. So, we're going to have to mark 48 times going around here. And we mark all 30 beads.
a very repetitious thing, but it's not hard to do. It'd probably take 10 or 15 minutes. And we're done. Okay, we are now at the point where we're ready to start burning. First of all, we'll remove all of the jigs and then we'll take the uh, project right off because you don't have to have it on the lathe to do the, to do the burning. In fact, it's much more comfortable if you've got it in your hands. There is our project on this side and on this side. We are now ready to start burning the spokes where they intersect with the uh, beads. So what we use is, is a, uh, a burning system this one is, comes from uh, Cam Merkel in Martinsville. His company is called Razor Tip Saskatchewan. They've, they have uh, recently put in another division called Bass and Maple, and th they have all kinds of little things that you need to do with carving and burning. I have the temperature on. I know that it's... Uh, at the right temperature because I, I practiced on it, on a, on a piece of blank wood, scrap wood rather, and it's ready to go. So, if you look very closely, you can see the tip, tip that I'm using. That is a 1 8 inch tip. And you remember, turning the beads with a one, one eighth inch tool. So this tip is made to fit over top of those, those beads. I hold it up in my hand this way. Personally, I like to have, have it in both hands. Put the uh, project in this hand and, and the pen in this hand and just pick out any one you want. Rock it back and forth, make sure we get down the sides. There is the, the first spoke burnt. Only 1,410 more burns to do. You just keep following, following the pencil mark and it'll be just fine. I'll do one more for you. There's the second spoke, 
and you just keep on going and going until you're done. Faber-Castell India Ink Pit Artist's Pens are best. Check to see if you can obtain the sizes and colors that you need. Unfortunately, we can't always get the colors that we want in, in all of the, all of the uh, same kind of pens. So you have to be prepared to pick out uh, what's available and use it as best you can. Other brands often come in numbers from 01 to 05. Amazon is a good source of pens and you can get some pens you need from art galleries, art supply stores, and Michaels in Saskatoon. Avoid using Sharpies as they run when a finish is applied. Each cell on your project should match each cell on the graph paper. Starting with one color, place a dot on each cell that uses that color. These, these are the dots for each cell and each color. These are black, yellow, red, and I've only, I've only done six rows. So uh, just, just as a sample, you don't need to watch me doing the whole, whole platter. So that's, that's how you mark it out and it gives you the indicator of what color to put in that cell and you shouldn't make a mistake uh, because you've got the dots on there. If you are using a light color, use only the ink you will be coloring the cell with. A darker color dot may show through the lighter color. Use the finest tip you can for the sides and bottom of the valleys. Be careful not to get any color on an adjacent cell. Use the larger tip pens to color the top surface of each cell. A sharp scalpel style knife can be used to scrape off a mistake, but it is better not to make the mistake. Work slowly, take frequent breaks. Remember, you're coloring 1440 cells. When getting ready to apply a finish, put some ink on a piece of scrap wood and apply a fine coat of finish to determine if the ink will run or not. Minwax Satin Spray Polyurethane works well. Real baskets are not shiny, so use a satin finish. Always use about five very fine coats. Be sure to finish all surfaces of your project.